Hello, it's uh, Dr. Kath here again, and today I'd like to talk about Melvilly Meadows. For me, nothing really sums up the summer better than a flower rich hay meadow in full bloom. And our Melvilly Meadows Reserve near Whitchurch is just one such place. If I had to choose one place to spend eternity in at one time, it would be Melvilly Meadows in early June. As you can see, there's a whole wealth of wildflowers here. It's a fabulous place. And this is me committing a small act of random wildness for June at Melvilly Meadows. The reserve was bought by the Wildlife Trust in 1995. And it's one of those farms that really was a bit stuck in a time wall. The, the farmer had done nothing to modernise. So he still had the hay meadows managed in a traditional way. It was where I had my first contact with Shropshire Wildlife Trust um, when I became warden there in 2004. And it was one of the best things I ever did. Um, really, it's just the most fabulous place. We've got 46.5 acres of it, and the majority of it is, is hay meadow. Um, the bit on the far right there, the big field on the far right, is permanent pasture, but the rest is hay meadows. Now, a hay meadow is actually, if you like, a constructed landscape. It wouldn't exist without human intervention. So it, it, it has to be managed as a hay meadow to stay flower rich and full of, full of the wildlife it has. But it's such a beautiful habitat and environment. Um, looking after it is really important. In the last hundred years or so, we've lost 98% of the traditional hay meadows in this country and mostly by be, them being reseeded with um, um, rye grasses and the use of silage rather than hay. <clears throat> the management of a hay meadow um, is such that um, it is allowed to grow from springtime. Traditionally, the meadows were stopped at Candlemas which is the 2nd of February. And after that, the stock would, on, on Candlemas, the stock would be removed from them and the plants would be allowed to grow. And then the hay, the hay crop would be there to be harvested during the summer. And then after the harvest, they were allowed to grow back a little bit and then livestock would be allowed onto it to feed on the aftermath, the regrowing grasses and herbs, and to manure the land a little. No other manure would be added to the land. And of course, all the cutting and everything is removed, it's baled, and that's winter fodder for the stock. So traditionally, they were open for grazing again at Lammas, which is the 1st of August. Um, Melvilly, the cut tends to be a little later because we really want the flowers to have set seed properly and drop the seed so that once it's cropped, the seed is lying there and will grow into more plants. The other thing is that you don't want um, the beast to be on the meadow when it's very wet because there's too much damage with the feet. You need some damage, you need to have the, the, the turf broken and the the animals hoof prints allow new places opened up for, for, the, for the seeds of the of the grass of, of the herbs of the, of the flowers but you don't want it to be completely poached so we don't tend to stick to the traditional days of movement but this is this is how it it generally looks The grazing and the hay is leased to Ford Hall Farm, which is 
fabulous partnership for us because as an organic farm, they manage it in the way we would like it to be managed. And they raise their young beef stock there. And in the summer, they're on the permanent pasture and then they graze the aftermath after that. Um, I'm sure it makes them extremely tasty. The other thing we have there is farm ponds. Now, they're another thing in the last hundred years, 90% of farm ponds have been lost and they're an important habitat. So these are fenced, as you can see, so the stock don't tread down the banks, but they have drinkers set in so they can access the water. And lovely flower rich place, full of stuff, full of newts, full of amphibians, and absolutely beautiful. But as you can see, the, the true glory of them, if you like, is, is, is the herbage, the flowers. Um, absolutely glorious vision of the long grasses and the, the, the diff absolutely full of flowers. Um, we have over 180 plant species at, at Meldley. And the, it's just through the summer, just fantastic. There are 31 species of grass compared to the maybe two or three you'd have on a sown grass lay. And that's important. It's very important for the wildlife. It's also good for the cattle. The one on the left here is crested dog's tail and the one on the right is sweet vernal grass. And that's the one that has that hay meadow smell. It, you know, it, it, if, you, if you just pick a head of it, you can smell newly mown hay there. It's absolutely lovely. And of course, they, they're flowering at slightly different times. Um, and you see, you see them at this stage when they're green, there's beauty in the seed heads. And then when they're a bit taller and they're drying off, the whole meadow can look like a sort of tawny wave, like a, like a lion's coat or something. And you, can, you can stand there and just watch it, like watching the sea. It's absolutely fantastic. This is um, meadow foxtail on the left and timothy grass on the right. So I'm not going to show you all 31 species. It's not, it, you know, it really isn't worth it, but um, they are lovely in their own right. We've also got nine species of rush there and seven species of sedge. So an awful lot of different plants. But the true glory of it is the flowers. <coughs> These are heath spotted and common spotted orchids. And they're at the absolute gem of this meadow because it's full of them. Um, you, they're recognisable as individual species, but the wretched things do hybridise quite readily. So you get ones that you really, you know, people say, is this a common spotted or a heath spotted? I say, well, it's actually, it's a halfway in between thing. So you can, you can see the really typical ones, but you get a lot there that are hybrids. So they, they look sort of neither one thing nor the other. And we've, fairly recently started getting southern marsh orchid there, which has a completely different shape of flower um, and rather a thicker stem. And lovely to see those as well. And that's a fairly recent addition, and not nearly so many of them. Now, when I was first there in 2004, there, was, there were two little patches of orchids. There was this one, and this is the whole extent of it. And there was this one in two different fields. And that was it. There were for orchids, that was it. Now we have them everywhere. And this is the product of the fields being managed properly. Um, before then we had we had problems with continuity of the, the farmers that were renting it, how they were cutting it. Um, you know, whether they were taking all the hay away and this sort of thing. But now we've got the management completely sorted 
and it really shows benefits in the in the flora of the place. There isn't a field there now that doesn't have orchids in it. And some of you can't put your foot down for treading in an orchid. You try to, but you know, they're just everywhere. Um at the best time for them is really from the late May bank holiday. Um going through to mid June. They don't they don't last forever. Um at that time of year they look absolutely great. Another important plant for hay meadows is yellow rattle or hay rattle. And this this plant is a hemiparasite, so it feeds on the grass, the roots of the grasses, as well as having its own chlorophyll. You can, I mean, it's got the green leaves and everything, but it weakens the grass, and this allows the wildflowers to grow and flourish because grass can be a bit thuggish. Um, so you have something that takes away some of its vitality. It gives space for the flowers to grow. And it's hay rattle, yellow rattle, because it has these inflated seed pods with, 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 with the ripe seeds in. And as you walk through the meadows and brush past them, you'll hear them rattling. And it grows thickly throughout the meadows. So this is doing a really good job keeping grasses from being too, um, too forceful. This is eyebright, and this is another hemiparasite. It's the same family, and a much smaller, more discreet plant, but quite a lovely thing. There's a lot of these wildflowers had herbal uses. Um, a hay meadow in you know sort of late medieval times really would have would have, would have been a like a pharmacopoeia. It would have produced plants that people were using as herbal cures and um, for different uses in, in looking after their health and looking after their homes. So eyebright, for example, is I mean it's still used in ointments for um for eye eye conditions. Um this is uh, any sort of inflammation or weakness of the eye. Um, you could infuse the plant or use the juice of the plant to um, improve the sight and the condition of the eyes. Pig nuts, these are another very typical meadow flower. You don't get them in disturbed ground. You have to remember that these meadow flowers, it's not the same as the flowers you get in, in, in a corn crop, for example. Those are annual, um, annual weeds of cultivation. So the poppies and this sort of thing, quite different from the meadow plants, which tend to be perennial. And pig nut is, it's a small umbellifer, it's a very dainty little thing, and it produces a, a tuber that's about the size of a largish marble. And it's a, on a very long, thin, thready root and then this fat tuber on it. So it's coming up every year from, from the tuber. Uh, they're very tasty, um, pig nuts, because pigs particularly love rootling for them, but to harvest them is incredibly difficult. You have, to, you have to follow this long thin thread down through the soil until you find this little tuber. Um, but obviously we don't want people digging them up all over the meadows, but it used to be quite important as a food source. Um, this one, not really as useful herbally. Um, Culpepper describes this as being under the dominion of Venus, it says. They provoke lust exceedingly and stir up those sports she is mistress of. So, yeah, basically, don't eat it. <laughs> but absolutely fabulous, dainty little plant, very delicate, very lovely. Really worth going, going and seeing it, even if you don't eat it. Torment Hill is a very low growing herb and has four petals. So this is uh, spread throughout the meadow 
again, a very typical thing of meadows and rather, rather a pretty little thing, but very low growing, rather discreet. And this is another herbal, herbal one that was used as an astringent. Um, it, it's good against um, to nourish and support the bowels. So it's interesting that so many of these plants have a herbal use because it's good for the stock for the grazing, the meadow as well. Um, farmers at, at, at one point would, would especially keep a meadow that with with a great variety of plants in it, a lot, lot of flowers in it, so that if one of their beasts was unwell, they would be turned out into this meadow to self-medicate. They would choose what to eat themselves according to what was wrong with them. So in in in, in Welsh it was the Kaya's Butty, the hospital field, and any stock that were looking a bit iffy um, are turned out into it and they will select the herbs to cure whatever is wrong with them. So these things would be important as part of the farm, um, not just for the hay, but also for the health of the beasts. This is betony. And betony was once used as a, as a, as a remedy for any, any ailments of the head. So um, bad headaches, neuralgia, um, anything, anything to do with nerves. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty thing, but also very health giving. Um, you can imagine that beasts would know that this was the thing to eat if they had a bad head. It can also be used, as a, you can use it in a tea, or it was recommended to be smoked with, in, in place of tobacco, with, with eyebright and colt's foot, if you have really bad recurrent headaches. So this is another health giving herb, but nice thing to see in the hay meadows, again, very traditional. This is one of the ones that it's, it's, it's Latin name, the, the species name of the, of the binomial, um, is officinalis, and anything that has officinal, officinalis as its species name was used as a herb. So, you know, this was a, this was a curing herb. Knapweeds, um, to be honest, I think that the great thing about knapweeds is they're much loved by, by butterflies. This great selection of flowers we have in the meadow is fabulous for pollinators. And knapweeds are great places to spot um, things like the burnet moths, the small copper butterflies, these sort of things. You're sitting on top of it, taking the nectar, and they're absolutely lovely, lovely plant. Sorrel is, um, people think it, it looks a bit like a dock, it's the same family but it's, it's, it's much more useful. Um, if, you're, if you're walking and, and you've forgotten to bring your bottle of water and you're feeling thirsty, or maybe if you've been cutting the hay in old times, just a, chew up a leaf of this and it's a lovely um, lemony acidic flavor and it brings saliva to your mouth and it, it, it will stop you being thirsty. You can recognize the leaves by the fact they have a little, few little spurs uh, where where it joins onto the onto the stem, so this is a, a useful pot herb. But you can use it in the kitchen, and it has these lovely red flowers, and they grow tall. So when the grass is tall and waving and ripening, you have these red flower heads waving with it. A lot of the meadow flowers grow either a tall flower head. From a, from a base of rosette leaves, which is more or less what the, the sorrel does, or scramble, so they'll climb up anything next to them, because they want to get their flowers up there above the grasses, where they can be seen by the pollinators and um, pollinated. This is the meadow buttercup. 
uh, there's a rather out of focus bit of sorrel there on the left, and some bush vetch. Um, and these are all the, the vetches are scrambling up amongst the grasses and amongst the sorrel, and the buttercups are putting their heads up above the grass level. So this is one a way they make sure they get pollinated. They they're getting up above the grass. Absolutely full of buttercups, meadow buttercups, um, celery leaf buttercups, um, a few creeping buttercups, but um, great variety of them um, all over the meadows. And they give that wonderful yellow sheen to the whole meadow. There's another yellow one is the bird's foot trefoil. And uh, this one is. Um, valuable really as, as the food plant for the caterpillars of the common blue butterfly which absolutely you know, gem of a butterfly and um, this this is what they need so all these plants in the meadow are a feast to the eyes but also supporting all the invertebrates that live on the meadow too so really important for pollinators for all those different creatures that are having problems in the countryside these days. Um, the, the seed pods of the bird's foot treffle are what give it its name, and this is them on the bottom right, looking really very much like a bird's foot. Um, this is meadow vetchling, same sort of family, um, rather treffle looking, but the leaves are quite different, and this is a scrambler. This is another one that climbs up amongst the other plants to, to get its flower heads up there. Uh, lots of this in the meadow as well. Very, very typical of traditional hay meadows. And this is one of my favourites. Uh, it's a very discreet little plant. Set flowers a little earlier before the grasses are right up. This is changing forget-me-not. And um, I'm very fond of them. They start off with a yellow flower which then becomes blue or sometimes pink as it matures. So it's got this lovely curled overhead. It's a very, very slender, very fine little plant. Um, very easy to miss, but it's an absolute delight. Um, when I first started watering the meadows, this was one that I didn't really know. And when I found it and identified it, I was absolutely thrilled. Such such a pretty little thing. <clears throat> this is spiny rest carry. Now this is a later flower. So these are, I mean, if you visit June to see the orchids, go back in July to have a look at the spiny rest carry. This is the only place in Shropshire you can see it. Um, there's not an awful lot of it. It's not widespread in the meadows. There's, 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 there's one place it's there every year and it's the most beautiful pink pea flower uh, on these upright stems which have quite sharp spines on them. Common rest harrow is a sort of prostrate sort of thing but spiny rest harrow has the upright stems and it's just absolutely gorgeous <coughs> and it's <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It survives really because it's in um, it's in a dip in the meadow that where where the the hay cutter can't get to. So that's why this one, being a late flower, has survived so well. The problem in hay meadows is if if you're a late if if the flowers are a, a late species, um, the chances are that it'll be cut before it sets seed. So you won't get a spread of it, but this one's doing quite well. And well worth going and having a look at it. It's just, it's a, it's a glorious thing. It's only about knee high, you know, it's not a great tall thing, but um, very, very pretty. And of course, these pea-shaped pea flowers, very much beloved of the bees. Um, a lot of, awful lot of bees, uh, well, all sorts of, loads of different species. So the variety of plants we have there is important for having the variety of pollinators. Um, you wouldn't get, if, if you have, you get basically bees coming short, short-tongued, long-tongued types and they use different flowers. So 
it's really important to have that variety for a good variety of insects. This is another lake one. This is sneezewort. And rather, rather lovely white flowers. And anything with the name, part of the name being wart, is, is again indicative of it being a healing herb. Um, this one isn't mentioned in the herbals. So obviously it was thought to cure sneezes, but it's kind of fallen out of use. But pretty little thing, absolutely lovely, not all that common. And Hay Meadows is really the best place finding it. Devil's Bit Scaly, another late one. And this is definitely in the curing herbs thing. This is, they, it was said that the, um, it, it's called Devil's Bit because it was such a useful curing herb that the devil bit off the root. Um, so it, 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 he, because he was so cross it was helping humanity and uh, Culpepper <coughs> the, 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 the herbalist said that the herb of the root all that the devil have left of it being boiled in wine and drank is very powerful against the plague and all pestilential diseases or fevers poisons also and the bitings of venomous beasts so if you get bitten by a venomous beast this is the one to go for it's a lovely thing it's it's very popular with pollinators these beautiful little blue flowers and um best if you're looking for it at melvely um look round round the edges of the fields because like i say it, it's a late flower so um tends to thrive in places that maybe the, the hay cutter has missed dog roses we have, we have great great mounds of dog roses there and they're just absolutely beautiful covered in bees and the the, the flowers from quite a, quite, a, quite a positive dark pink to a to almost white and then replaced in the autumn by by the um rose hips the red rose hips and absolutely lovely things and this another one that was used as a herb obviously the, the hips are very good uh, full of vitamin c um the flowers could be used uh, in, in to make rose water and it thrives in the hedges round round the reserve we have we have fantastic hedges there and these brambly um thorny plants are really good for the birds and everything and it's just a joy to behold it really is here's an unusual one this is moscatel or the Town Hall clock flower. And this one grows in, in one little place in Mulvey, and it's it's an, an ancient woodland indicator. So it, it it's growing in the meadows, which is actually a woodland plant, and it has these incredibly discreet little green flowers that have it, it basically it, it's got got them arranged four round the top of the stem and then one on top does look like a town hall clock and uh, well worth having a look for so it's uh, one of my favorites again because it's very self-effacing very discreet but really rather lovely and obviously where it's growing the it used to be woodland so <clears throat> this is our disappearing plant of melvely meadows this is uh, dyer's green weed and it's one of those ones that you hardly ever see. It, it'll pop up one year in five or something. And if, you, if you're lucky, you get to see it. And if you're not, you miss it amongst all the other yellow bits in the meadow. So watch out for Dyer's green weed and please let me know where it is if you find some. It looks like a, a, a small stunted broom plant. Um, it rather, again, sort of pea flower shaped yellow flowers and um, the, the short sort of short stems with, with, with fine broom like leaves. We've got two kinds of grassland at Melbourne. We've got the, the drier grassland which we've been just talking about the flowers of and then patches of quite considerably wetter 
sedgier grassland. Um, moving on to those now, this is marsh marigold. Um, some years there isn't very much, and some years these wetter areas are absolutely covered in it. Um, it's absolutely glorious. It's quite a, quite a, one of the earlier flowers, and there's something about that golden yellow that when you go and it's just come out, if it's a good year for it, um, there's half a field of it there, it really lifts your spirits. It's just such a joyful colour. And this is the seed head of it. And doesn't it look like something you found under sea or at the rock pool or something? I just, just as pretty as the flowers, really. Uh, glorious, glorious plants, really. In the same areas, you'll find ragged robin, which has these, it's like a sort of punk campion, if you like. Um, they, they have these, these wonderful tattered petals and again can grow in great masses. This is uh, Pete Boardman looking for crane flies amongst the, uh, the ragged robins, but you, you can see what a, what a good spread of them there were that year. Another one that some years you get a really good show of them, and other years perhaps not so much, but uh, there's always some about. And again, these things are spreading in different areas of the reserve through the years. So um, everything that, I mean, they, they used to be contained in small areas are being spread out throughout the reserve. And there's lots more to see and lots more to enjoy. <clears throat> Another of the damper area plants is bugle. And this is absolutely lovely little plant. It's, it's, it's very small, it's only about ankle high. And this was another one that was very important as a, as a medieval herbal cure. Um, it was known as sickle wart. And it's, it, an infusion of it is good for stopping bleeding. You know, which would, obviously, if you cut yourself with your sickle, you would have bleeding. And this is the stuff that will stop it. Um, it's also used for coughs, um, spitting of blood in consumption. It lowers and slows the pulse and stops coughing and irritation and balances your circulation and all sorts of, you know, there's lots and lots of good, good uses. Um, Culpepper, Culpepper said, keep a spirit syrup of it to take inwardly and plaster of it to use outwardly, always by you. So this was a very much an approved herb, and it, it, has those, it does have those properties. So if you've got a, a bleeding cut, um, this, the, an infusion of, of, of bugle, or even just the green herb laid on it, will help stop the bleeding. It would be very useful in a hay meadow, if you think about it. This is meadow sweet. Now, interestingly enough, the name doesn't come from a meadow, as in you know what we think of as a, like a hay meadow. It 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 was it was mead sweet. It was used um, in to flavour ale before people used hops. So nothing to do with meadow really, but it's one that pops up in the in these damper areas, and it's it's another lovely thing. It's a strewing herb. It was used to throw up, to put on the ground, to um, freshen the air in, in, in houses where they had, where they had dirt floors. Um, one of the three, three herbs most sacred to the Druids. So absolutely lovely thing. It's got this sort of fluff of white flowers and um, the, the, the roots, um, Made into a, into a, into a tea and white wine, are good against against fever. And this is actually where aspirin was originally um, taken from. So aspirin is I mean, everybody thinks it's, it's from willow bark, which has the sim similar properties. But actually, it was from the roots of meadow sweet, and it's aspirin because the Latin name of meadow sweet was spirea. So it's something to know if you. You're walking about and you you you, you need something as a as a as a painkiller. Um, 
to the root of it. Try it out. See if it works. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fine plant. This is spearwort, lesser spearwort. Again, that name wart suggesting that this one would be um, curative. Generally speaking, people thought because it looked a bit like something, it would cure whatever. So this one has sort of spear shaped leaves, and they thought because of that, it would cure spear wounds. But you're better off with the bugle, really. This one's quite marshy places, but good, good bits of it around the reserve. It's another of the buttercups. And uh, this one is marsh bed straw in similar sort of places. There's, there's areas that we have in the winter in the reserve, there, there's standing water for some time. It's not deep, um, but these particularly wet areas, you'll get the spear wart and the marsh bed straw in. <clears throat> this was another strewing herb. It kept insects out of the house um, if, if you used it as a flooring in the days before fitted carpets. This is needed. And of course, when it got a bit battered, you swept it out and put another wart in. Um, pretty dainty thing, quite a low growing thing, with this typical fall of leaves around the stem in the same way as things like woodruff have. We also have summer fungi there. So even if, you, if, you're, if you're more of a fungus buff than a wildflower buff, it's still worth going around and having a look. This is on that <clears throat> very distinctive dead tree that you saw in the slide earlier on, um, standing there in the meadows, and it grows this wonderful chicken of the woods fungus. Um, it's an early fungus, it's a summertime fungus, and I always think it looks rather as if you sprayed that um, insulating foam and it's crept out through a crack and it's made this wonderful fungus. It's a very tasty fungus. Um, I was extremely annoyed a couple of years ago because one had grown and I thought, I'll come back and get that. You know, don't want to take it off until it's fully grown and it's done its sporing and everything, and somebody beat me to it. So I never got to eat it, but it's a lovely, lovely thing. It's a beautiful yellow colour and looks as if it flowed out of a crack in the tree. The other fungus the meadows are famous for is, is, is the pink wax cap or ballerina wax cap. You can see that this, it looks like a, a ballerina's tutu. And this grows um, after the hay has been cut in the right year, which depends very much on the rainfall and what the season has been like. But we get little troops of these beautiful pink wax caps. And this is, is quite a rare one. This was a, a biodiversity action plant species for Shropshire. Um, it, quite unusual. And there it is. They look absolutely great. Lots of other wax caps there as well in the meadows. Um, scarlet ones, yellow ones, parrot ones. And really worth going and having a look just to see these fabulous range of colours um, of these, these little fungi. In a good year, uh, you'll find them all over the meadows. We we'll get slightly later. These are these are these are once the aftermath is greened up, and you're heading into autumn. You'll get these. Just look at a few of the uh, the invertebrates that are there, flourishing on all those wonderful flowers. Um, this is a, a meadow brown, and um, the meadow can um, absolutely full of them. Every every step you take, there are butterflies going berserk all around you. Um, I did. I did the butterfly, you know, the, the sort of annual butterfly count there, um, several years running, and um, it's actually quite difficult to count them. So this this one's a meadow brown, and this is my favourite. This is small copper, and I think that most useful, perfect little butterfly. And you quite often see them sitting on a knapweed or a thistle or one of these upstanding flowers, and they just glow they're, they're small small butterfly this one doesn't really do them credit because you can't get that glorious bright jewel glow from them they have these little tails on they're actually one of the blue butterflies believe it or not um but obviously not not blue um they they're quite 
quite common. The, the, the seed plant for the, 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 sorry, the food plant for the caterpillar is sorrel. So they do very well because there's lots of sorrel and they're busy. Lots of nectar for them as well. And, and they're there having a wonderful time, but absolutely glowing in the sunlight. Just perfect little thing. This is the common blue. Remember, this is the one that the caterpillars feed on the bird's foot trefoil. Again, lots of them about, and the most perfect things. I mean, look at the colour of that. And sometimes you walk through and you've got the flowers growing and the butterflies, it looks as if half the flowers have taken flight. The, the butterflies are coming up all around you. There's some skipper butterflies do well there. They, they, they're ones that um, use grasses to, to feed the caterpillars, lay their eggs on. And the skippers can be seen there as well. These are not quite as obvious, but um, but rather lovely things. And in a good year, one of my butterfly survey years there was a painted lady year. And one of the fields was just covered in them. It was covered in orchids. And then above that, it was covered in painted ladies. And then the sight of that was absolutely incredible. Uh, Glorious things, absolutely glorious. We don't get them in large numbers every year. We would get some, but um, occasionally, every few years, there's a, a really, really good invasion of them. They're 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 a migrant, and they they come over, come over the channel, and they move right up through the country. So, if it's a good year for seeing them, if it's a good year for painted ladies, it's just um, the spectacle when they when they are there. Absolutely fantastic. And this one amazed me. This is a purple hair streak. And they're one of those ones you very rarely see. They they breed in the tops of oak trees, but they 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 their adult time is at the tops of oak trees and they they they're mating up there if you like. And they very occasionally come down to the ground. Uh, I was there doing a plant survey and walking under it, we've got some splendid big standard oak trees around in, in the hedges and around the reserve. And at the bottom of one, I found this uh, a purple hair street butterfly. And I'd never seen one before. I was so excited. Uh, fortunately, I had a, a, a bug box in my bag. And I managed to catch it and proper look at it, and it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, terribly hard to see if they're up at the tops of the oak trees that were flying around, but I felt so privileged that this thing had actually landed on the ground in front of me. That really made my day. Such such a pretty pretty thing. The day flying moths are good as well. This is a, a, a burnet moth, and there it is. On top of a um, napweed, like I was saying earlier, but lovely, lovely colours, and always worth going and having a look. There's something for everybody. You can go and look at the flowers, the grasses, the butterflies, the moths, the bees. Lots of bees there. This is a tawny mining bee, and there's a bank there that has lots and lots and lots of these little um, sandy volcanoes. With the hole in the top that the, the the mining bees live in and they're absolutely wonderful they're thriving there they're buzzing amongst the flowers it's a it's like stepping back into the countryside as it was what 50 60 years ago there's so much life there dragonflies use it because they're hunting the other insects so this is an emperor dragonfly and uh, this was actually this was taken at Melbourne and they're flickering across the surface of the grasses and the flowers. You can, also, you can hear them go, you can hear the clattering of them, and using those farm ponds as places to breed. We have birds there too, obviously. And we have three species of owl use the meadows. This is a, a barn owl, um, tawny owl. We also have little owls there. Um, really, the the ambition is always to see <clears throat> see the barn owl and 
I, I took a group from the Witch Church branch there once, and you know, it's an evening walk, and they're all hoping to see the bar now. I thought terrible. I'd let them down. They haven't seen the bar now. And right at the end of it, when I was saying, doing the bit about, I hope you've enjoyed your visit, sort of thing, one of them glided along the hedge behind us. So we got to see the bar now in the end. Um, they're absolutely lovely. They use the meadows because they're absolutely full of small mammals, plenty of things for them to hunt. They'll follow the hedgerows, <clears throat> picking out the bowls and mice among the grasses. So great place for owls, full of the things they like to eat. So obviously it's, <clears throat> it's a grand place for them to be. Grey partridges there. I'd never have known that, except I went there with my Labrador, and being a Labrador, he put up a pair of grey partridges out of, out of the hay. If I'd been there on my own, I'd walk straight past them. They keep hunkered down, you don't see them, but they're there. They're a farmland bird that's really decreasing. These meadows are fabulous places for them. <clears throat> they're, uh, they, they, they're eating seeds themselves, but they need the insects, the chicks. So they're, um, the farm, farms as they are in the um, intensified way, the farms are joining Melbourne with the um, seeded lays, with the single species grass lays, and the um, arable fields aren't so suitable for these farm farmland birds as farms used to be. So they really appreciate somewhere like Melbourne um, to raise a young and to go on with their traditional way of life. Um, very rarely see these, but I know they're there. <laughs> you have to take your Labrador or a Spaniel. Bushes are full of warblers. Um, there's a lot of jays there that you, you, you hear chattering in the, in the in the big oak trees. They like the acorns, obviously. And they're making a noise like parrots. But um, the singing birds, the small birds singing, these chattering jays, all that sort of thing. The soundscape of Melville, I mean, if I had a recording of it, it um, it's just wonderful. I, I, mean, I can lie around in the grass and just listen, not look at anything. And of course, with all those seeds and everything, the flocks of goldfinches love it. So we, we, we get numbers of goldfinches eating, eating the grasses, eating the weed seeds and the flower seeds. So very, very good for birds because there's so much life there. There's so much insects there because there's so much variety of plants there. So it's a whole ecosystem just in 46 acres. So worth going and I mean, whatever your wildlife interest is going to be something for you. There's badger sets there. Later on in the summer, come you know, about July time, if you're walking, even in daylight, there's a good chance it, there'll be baby young badgers around. I've, I've been nearly run over by them. Um, they just sort of rushing through the grass past you. Um, and hares. Again, don't see them that often. They prefer to stay lying down hidden rather than running away from you. But they're there, they're around. It's a wonderful place for them. They can lie hidden. But a glorious thing to see. Always worth it. And again, thriving in an unspoilt, carefully managed farm landscape. There's a perfection to it. There's a, it when you look at a, 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 an intensively farmed field of grass for, that they're going to make silage with, it's all one colour. It might as well be green tarmac as far as wildlife goes. But this is absolutely bouncing with wildlife. So there we are. I'm down on my knees. We need to keep these places. We need your support to have these reserves, to keep these tiny, tiny gems there in the countryside. So do your bit. Usual ask. 
come on, join us today. Every membership, every penny from every membership is going towards looking after these places. So do the right thing. Go and visit the meadows because they are such a good experience. Don't forget, beginning of June is a good time. End of May, beginning of June. Um, go and see the orchids. Go and see the flowers. Really enjoy it and help us keep it special. Help us keep these places in Shropshire um, without being deliberately looked after. They go, they, they, they disappear. That's why we've lost so many of them. So have a think about it. Go away. Join up. Um, and do visit. Really, it's it's. Um, if you if, if there's one thing to do while you're going wild in June, third days wild, having a visit to to, to a proper hay meadow has got has really got to be right up there. Thank you very much.